Alright, what's going on, podcast family? It's me, your boy Agostino. Welcome to our episode of the Agostino Zingo Show, episode number 84 with me, your host, Agostino. What up, man? Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Happy coffee day to you. It's not actually happy coffee day, but you know, I'm gonna put I'm gonna drink my coffee because yeah, why not? Why not keep my esophagus lubricated while I talk to you about the things I've seen on the interwebs earlier on this week? How are you guys doing, huh? As you can see, today is a clout chasing, clout chasing podcast episode. And if you're wondering, why do you call it a clout chasing podcast episode, I guess, you know? Look at the glasses! <laughs> I bet you didn't notice these fuckers, eh? Bet you didn't notice these Kurt Cobain fucking SoundCloud rapper-esque shades. Um, that are covering my eyelids, but yeah, I feel I feel comfortable wearing sunglasses indoors. Actually, it's weird, isn't it? That's probably how you know I'm black, right? Um, there's uh, there's a few markers about me that somehow can probably throw people off, right? The music I listen to, the books I read, the stuff I watch, right? The things I like to do, they can probably throw you off a little bit. Think, oh, is this guy black for real? But then when I start wearing sunglasses indoors, you know, you know. You know I ain't fucking around, man. You know I like to wear all white, right? You know I like diamond chains. You know that, man. You know I like to play my music out loud, ridiculously fucking loud volumes, you know, on loop while driving around my area. You know that's deep down inside of me. You know. Oh, God. Welcome back. Welcome back. Episode number 84. As, as I promised, here I am back again in the hot seat talking to you lovely people. Hope you're all well and doing great wherever you are and life is treating you um, as great as it is to me. Today I took a break from working out if you're wondering, right? Because I haven't got that much of a sweat on today. Um, I take a break in the week so my Thursday is my day off and then I'm going to start again on Friday and then Saturday, Sunday. So kind of have one day off in a week just to kind of like, you know, rest and relax. But Sunday is going to be a bit of a warm down day, more stretching, more body weight stuff, not many weights. Saturday will probably be a, a good weight session but not too much because I don't want to get too fucked up just in case I might go out later. But in general, it's good to take a little break in between in the middle of the week. And usually, whenever I do take a break in the middle of the week, I'm, I always feel a bit more tense. So I am feeling a little bit tight anyway, muscle-wise. So it probably is a good idea that I took the day off today. But no days off from the podcast. So here I am again. Check me out, motherfuckers. Live and direct from Stratford. Hope you guys are doing well. Not going to waste any time. Going to jump right into it and get straight into the topics and all that malarkey. But as ever... If you want to find out more information about stuff that I'm doing, DJ spots and stuff and all that other malarkey, or you want to read my blog and, and check out stuff that I'm, I'm reading, stuff that I'm writing, topics I'm interested in, check the link below, accidentalzingo.com, my website's there, it's got all my links to all my platforms and you can check that out. But yeah, man, fuck. I stumbled across this video, right, that I would recommend, if you have a job that you hate, you probably shouldn't watch, right? But... I've had this weird thing going on in my mind recently, right? I've been thinking about a lot that I think a lot of people aren't thinking about and everyone's a bit naive about it and they're all kind of going around this weird little days. But, and it, and it kind of stems from this, right? I'm going to give you a bit of a background on where kind of my thinking come from. I've always hated do-gooders, right? I've always hated home monitors. I've always hated um, suck-ups, right? I don't know what it is about me, but I've always had a real sense of rage whenever a hall monitor or somebody that's been assigned self-assigned some sort of like leadership role kind of tells me what to do right it really pisses me off especially when it's an adult it's like what the fuck is wrong with you you're a grown person and you've kind of taken this responsibility for instance like the, the building i live in right that we've got some sort of like apartment warden person right who knocked on our door when we first moved in and declared themselves the warden or some shit and then a few months later when i was djing or mixing in my house um they came around and said oh neighbors i've been complaining about your noise and all this sort of bullshit just a real smarmy whiny point deskery dork right like a dork in a fullest extent right a snitching dork not even a nerd nerds are cool an absolute dork right um, and it's even worse, probably it's even worse when you're younger, because like, look, we're all kids, man, we're all trying to have fun, and you're here being the fucking anti-fun police, right, it's just not cool, never liked it, it's always annoyed me. <coughs> so when I got to a point of working, or when I got to a point where I had to enter the workforce, right, when I had to get a job, and the other shit I was doing outside of, of work that allowed me not to have a job wasn't continuing, because, you know, I used to resell trainers, and all that malarkey, which kind of kept me out of being employed for a long time. I kind of wish I stayed doing that sort of stuff, but I just couldn't. 
handle having to suck up to people in order to kind of get shoes first you know when you're queuing up you get you get when, when, if you don't know when you queue up in front of a shop um numerous times you get known by managers and by store staff and over time manager store staff change so then you're constantly having to fucking you know you're constantly having to you know throw people's penises left to right in order to kind of get the shoes that you want and I'm not necessarily that person. I just can't do it. That isn't my gig, nor my MO. It's just not something that's part of my DNA, right? Cool. Safe. So because of that, I had to then enter the fucking workforce. I had to go in, you know, cap in hand, my bloody CV, and enter the workforce. And what I hated even more than anything in the fucking workforce, right? What I hated more than having a timetable, than being told when I can go on lunch, than being told when I can go on holiday. The thing that made me hate employment the most, right, was people at work right, who took it upon themselves, right, to give themselves a kind of like false sense of superiority just because they managed to have a job, right, it annoyed me so much to no end, especially when most of the jobs that I've been working or I've worked at have been jobs that, you know, a monkey could do, um, they don't necessarily require a, a high level, a high IQ level, they're not necessarily a role that requires somebody to troubleshoot complex problems. Um, they're not necessarily a job that is very much in demand. They're usually jobs that require you to maybe be known with people so you can kind of slip in and get in through the front door. But for the most part, they're low entry to mid-level jobs that generally the most of the population could get away with doing, right? But somehow you go into these kind of workplaces and you have people who really get a big sense of self-worth from the job that they're working at, right? And it always used to bug me because it wasn't a sense of self-worth that, you know, they kept to themselves where they were kind of proud of the work they'd done. They went back home and they looked at their kids and they were proud that they went to a work and kind of earned the bread to kind of keep that kid fed and make sure they earned the money to keep a roof over the kid's head. It was like an inner pride. No, it wasn't that. It was like an outward thing. Like, it was a thing of like... um. I work in this department, you work in that department, but somehow your department's better than mine when we're both working for the same fucking company. We're both getting cracked on the back on the whip, right? We're both getting, you know, told what to do, essentially. We both have a limit to how much we, autonomy we have in the company overall. So I never got that, right? <clears throat> and I never appreciate when people smashed it in your face, right? That they thought they were better. It's just, it's just a, I think it's a, it's a, it's a trait that humans should, um, do their very best to push away like don't be that person who's being i think smugness is one of those kind of things that everyone would could be annoyed by no one's gonna be happy that no one's gonna be glad that you're the smug person in the room right you're always going to annoy somebody so i think to protect to kind of like cover yourself and to make sure no one gets annoyed at you just don't be the smug guy in the room no one appreciates it no i guarantee you no one appreciates it anyway long story short i hate that sort of stuff right so I never got it and that kind of led to my disdain for employment overall because it's just like a it, it, it kind of it kind of um it seemed like a festival for people who didn't have any self-worth outside of work deeming gleaming all their self-work from what the job that they did but then that got me thinking right it got me thinking that in the future when ai eventually does take over right and the jobs that i the, the kind of job that i have or the jobs that other people have where they could they could be automated right we have we have a, a we have a kind of not to get specific in the job that I do, but we have a, an action in our role. We have an, an action in the job. We have an action we, uh, that I do in the job that I do. Whoa, why can't I speak today? We have uh, we have commands in the job that I do that could easily be done by a robot, right? Or by some sort of sophisticated AI. And I was thinking, in a few years, when that gets really uh, advanced or really good, right? Imagine um, when you're calling customer services like reps on the phone and it's an automated line and... Or you're calling like PayPal and they're like, oh, um, problem with your account? No, what's wrong with your account? Uh, withdrawals. And then it recognizes what you say, withdrawal. And then it goes to the next thing, right? And then you go through all that troubleshooting stuff before um, you get to an agent. So effectively, if, if the AI is good enough, they could effectively sort out your issue without you going to a fucking agent, right? Oh, actually, that being said, I remember there was this video that um, Google did, right? Uh, before I show you this other video that I've been talking about, but a video that Google AI did about um, an, an advanced AI system like a book, a hairdresser appointment for you, right? Let me see if I can get this up. Google AI hairdresser. Oh, there we go. Yeah, it's come up straight away. Amazing. So, this is, this is something that I think... Uh, 
is going to be the future and will possibly like take over all jobs, right? And it's something that has been worrying me in general, right? Something that I get worried about, something that I wake up in cold sweats about. Like, so yeah, let me just play this quickly and you guys can Good check it out. Well done. As I said earlier, our vision for our assistant is to help you get things done. Well done. It turns out a big part of getting things done is making a phone call. Yo, how you Asian is this guy, by the way? Schedule, Let me show this. Maybe call a plumber in the middle of the week or even schedule a haircut appointment. Go, yeah. There you go. You know, we're working hard to help users through those moments. Hopefully you guys can see this if now. We want to connect users to businesses in a good way. Businesses actually rely a lot on this, but even in the US, 60% of small businesses don't have an online booking system set up. We think AI can help with this problem. So let's go back to this example. Let's say you want to ask Google to make you a haircut appointment on Tuesday between 10 and noon. What happens is the Google Assistant makes the call seamlessly in the background for you. So what you're going to hear is the Google Assistant actually calling a real salon to schedule the appointment for you. Let's listen. Oh, how can I help you? Hi, I'm calling to book a women's haircut for a client. Um, I'm looking for something on May 3rd. Sure, give me one second. Mm-hmm. Sure, what time are you looking for around? At 12 p.m. We do not have a 12 p.m. available. The closest we have to that is a 1.15. Do you have anything between 10 a.m. and uh, 12 p.m.? Depending on what service she would like, what service is she looking for? Just a woman's haircut for now. Okay, we have a 10 o'clock. 10 a.m. is fine. Okay, what's her first name? The first name is Lisa. Okay, perfect. So I will see Lisa at 10 o'clock on May 3rd. Okay, great. Thanks. Great. Have a great day. Bye. Now. If that doesn't scare you or if that doesn't worry you, I don't know what planet you're living on and maybe you don't watch stuff like Black Mirror and all that malarkey, but that got me thinking, right? Imagine so all those good do-gooders I hate that have uh, that have jobs and act like, you know, they have a they have a false sense of superiority because they managed to keep a steady job, right? Like especially a job that doesn't that could be done by a monkey, right? Um never got it. And then roll on to the future when AI gets sophisticated, right? AI gets really flipping good right imagine it gets so good to the level that your job is obsolete if that happens fast forward again this thing called ubi universal basic income might come into effect and the idea of universal basic income is that the government would subsidize everyone who was out of work right um with an allowance whether it be weekly um monthly or yearly right so they might give you like i don't know like a set wage of a thousand pound a month uh, and then on top of that, you can maybe work vocationally or you can work part time and get extra money on top or a thousand five hundred. Whatever they could decide is the medium amount of money for your age and your experience level. They'll figure all that um, final detail stuff out. But I have always been worried that I think a lot of people would be because, you know, there's this thing where everyone's kind of like talking about mental health and depression and shit has been a big surge of it happening nowadays, like in media and stuff. It seems like everyone's speaking about it. I've been a bit dubious about this kind of um, legit, the of legitimacy of it, right? Because I think there's no, there's no, uh, it's no coincidence that mental health and all that kind of things and all those kind of stuff has been kind of pushed in the forefront, right? And social media has also been at its highest peak, right? Like people are turning away from like um, terrestrial TV and gleaning most of the entertainment from social media feeds, right? Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, whatever it may be. There. That's why everyone, most people spend their time on those kind of devices. So it's, it's no coincidence that depression and mental health issues are going up and then people are spending a lot of time on social media because social media and all that stuff, it, it flattens us all out, doesn't it? It makes us all accessible. So I can, I can follow the rock and it seems as if we're on the same level. It's not same level, but we're in direct he's in my direct view right and he keeps uploading amazing videos of him working now or him with a i don't know with a big crowd of people imagine if i'm an actor a big crowd of people or doing this or this movie did this many millions at the box office and it makes me feel like shit 
but only because we have access to it. Before we didn't. We only we could only see their final product. We could only see their movies or we could only see the highlight. Not even a highlight. But we could only see like a snapshot of their life. But now we kind of are able to just piece together. Uh, maybe not the best representation, but a close enough representation of what their life is like, right? So going back to what I said before. So imagine AI gets started that advanced that all those jobs have been obsolete. Then the government steps in and gives everyone UBI, universal basic income, and says, hey, you don't have to work anymore, so here's a set salary of 1500 to kind of uh, keep a roof over your head and to keep you fed. I think people will be suffering from huge bouts of depression because those very same people, they glean all their self-worth, all of their... Um, their identity is wrapped up completely in a job that they do. Regardless of how important or non-important it is, regardless of how valuable or non-valuable it is to the society overall, that's where their identity comes from. They are not who they are without that job. So you take that away and that's a huge, huge part of someone's personality, which is, I think, really sad. And I think it's only a problem that exists um, in Western Europe, right? I don't think this happens in the Mediterranean from where I've been, right? When I visited places in Spain, and places in France and stuff like, or in Franca nations, whatever. I don't think that exists there because it seems if they they enjoy the downtime outside of work, they don't live to they don't work to live or they don't they don't work to live or whatever that combination of fucking saying is. I wish I knew who it was. It's more about enjoying your company with your friends, actual friends, not people that you met at work, right? Like real friends. I'm not saying people you meet at work are not your friends, but you know you know what I mean. People that actually know you. Um, or for, or for lack of a better term, people that actually know what your mum's name is, right? Or, I don't know, met your sister or brother and shit. That could be your actual friend. So they kind of put a lot of value in hanging out with friends and spending time together in groups and taking long dinners and long lunches and shit. That's part of their lifestyle, right? You go to some places, you go to Madrid or Barcelona in Spain and you go to the main city centre or the main strip and shit and shops are closed by, I don't know, nine eight o'clock all right and that would that would be unheard of in most shopping most metropolitan shopping centers especially in london anyway for the most part places they open for su super late people have to work all around the clock and shit it's just ridiculous right i remember we were once when i used to work in retail one of, one of these managers i used to work for was a fucking amazing manager saying to me once like um no because i i think i would naively asked him oh are we gonna get a boxing day off and he kind of giggled right and said to me i guess you know the only day we're closed is christmas right so that kind of idea of like working around the clock, right? But imagine that person is taken out of it. And imagine most stores are like set up like McDonald's places, right? Where you can kind of order, you can order your thing from a kiosk, right? And there might be three or four free employees there at most, right? In the store. Imagine that's the case. And they give you money and you have all this free time, but then you don't have an identity. What are you going to do? You're going to be sad. And I think that's the thing that annoys me, right? And then going back to the video that I saw earlier, because I'm going in fucking mad tangents, this video really brought it home and really kind of crystallized my thoughts. Something I've been thinking about a lot. And I didn't know this, this guy even existed before I had these thoughts. But I heard it mentioned by Duncan, Duncan Trussell, um, a really funny comedian on Theo Vaughan's podcast. You should definitely check it out. I mem he mentioned it on his podcast and I thought I'd check it out. So basically this guy's name's David Graeber and he's written a book called Bullshit Jobs. It started off as an essay. Then he got that essay and kind of filled it out into a book. But um, I definitely recommend you check it out. Or I'll, I'll show it now actually. He's what he's kind of says on the whole idea on bullshit jobs. But again, if you're working somewhere that you hate, right, and you don't want to be reminded that you have a job that you don't like, please fast forward <laughs> because this will kind of bum you out a little bit. But for those who are brave enough to withstand the pressures of employment, watch this right now. over the years that you keep meeting people who are embarrassed by what they do. You meet them at a party, and especially if you're someone like me, I'm an anthropologist, and most people think that's kind of interesting. So, you know, so, oh, you're an anthropologist, what is that? Do you go to, like, foreign countries? you live in villages? Like, what's that like? And how do you, you know, how do you, so they'll start asking all these questions, and um, then you say, well, what do you do? And I'll, you know, and I, you know, and you get them a little drunk, you press them, tell you the truth, I mean, I got this job on the, the senior East Coast white vision manager for this company, and I don't really do any of it. You know, I, I just like file reports, and nobody really reads them. We create these committees and pass things back and forth, and so um, And so I started asking people, you know, like how often, you know, what about your? Do you actually do anything at your job? You know, how how many hours a day do you really work? And a lot of people say, well, 
you know, to be honest, I think what I do, I could probably do it in three hours, but a week, you know. Um, but I stretch it out, and they always say, like, don't tell my boss, okay? But, you know, a computer could do this whole thing. So you get all these people, and, and I thought about it, and I thought, this is really interesting, because this is exactly what capitalism isn't supposed to do. You know, back in the Soviet Union, they did stuff like that. They made up all these jobs because they had a full employment program. Uh, everybody had to have a job, whether or not you actually needed them to be doing anything. So they would, you know, set up these things where to buy a piece of beef in the store, you'd have to, like, go to one person to get the beef, and then you had a ticket, and then you have to take a ticket on another line. They just make up employment. Um, but we're doing something like that, except it's all being done by the private sector. Most of these people weren't working for the government. So... Um, I'll link that video to the in the show description, so I don't want to keep talking about stuff like oh, oh my friends here. I'll link this video to the in the show description so you guys can check it out yourself. But it's definitely something that I think is very, very. Um, I want to say it's it's something to keep in mind, right? When uh, whenever you're in the place places that you don't like and stuff, and just just to think in general about what's happening in the future. But I think for me personally, anyway, just to kind of put a kind of positive slant on this. Um, the lessons I think to be gleaned from this in general are, you know, like I think I mentioned yesterday on the, the podcast the other day, if you are working somewhere that you're not enjoying, life is short, man. Like we only have one shot at this, right? Um, I don't expect anyone or everyone to be working in a job or in a vocation that they fully enjoy 100%, right? That's a bit unrealistic to expect that. But I do think there's a level of happiness that needs to be gleaned from somewhere that you're spending eight hours a day at, right? Um, you need to be happy to some extent. Um, that's that like 36 hours a week right so it's a lot of time that you're spending in that one place so it should be something that you're enjoying to some extent so if you're somewhere that you're not enjoying and it's not going well for you of course don't quit um straight away maybe start looking for stuff whilst you're in the job that you're applying in and maybe start applying in different places but i would highly recommend wherever you are if, especially if it's somewhere that you're working where it earns you a lot of money and you have those golden handcuffs on right, and you feel like you, you can't leave because the money's too good and you've got you uh, you've got like accustomed to a, a certain way of life but you're not actually enjoying the nine to five please uh, take my advice on it uh reconsider applying somewhere where you might not where you might earn less but you might have a better sense of self-worth you might have better job satisfaction um, and you might in general just be a better human being because you're working somewhere that you enjoy and you in turn uh, end up having being in a better mood that serves your family and your friends better. It's just a better way to go about things. I don't think we should be, I don't, I don't think nowadays in 2018, anyone who is of a reasonable education level or a reasonable um, IQ should be working in a job that they uh, hate just because they need to keep a roof over their head. You shouldn't be doing that unless you have to do that, right? Um, if you have the choice, please do something that you enjoy um the end is coming right um that asteroid is gonna fall on this earth and obliterate us all <laughs> no, i'm joking but yeah let's try and get let's try and work places that we do enjoy if you don't enjoy it don't be that fucking misery guts at work that's always complaining keep it to yourself please you know like usually you know keep it to yourself um, and just apply and go somewhere else that's probably the lesson of the day in my respects but yeah, I saw that and I thought it was funny. So I'm gonna, I'm def, I'm reading, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm actually gonna read his audio book now at the moment. So you can definitely check that. I think it might be should be available on all the all, all the audio books websites, and I'm sure I'm pretty sure he's got it in paperback too. So that's David Greiber on bullshit jobs. What's next on the docket? Ah, interesting news. So yesterday night, um, I was, uh, I stayed up a bit late. Usually I don't stay up so late, but I stayed up, I stayed up a bit late. Oh, take this off the screen. I stayed up a bit late yesterday night. And I was on Twitter and I must have uh, stumbled upon news that the Hackney Council were voting on a new bill that would restrict um, the licensing laws for bars and nightclubs within the borough of Hackney. I heard it mentioned a few uh, weeks ago, a few months ago, I think um, this, is it a lobby group? Is it Safe Hackney or Hackney? For, oh, I don't know, I'll get up on the screen in a minute. But this lobbying group was basically tra um, campaigning for it. And I remember seeing it uh, being kind of like spoken about a lot on the Hackney Wick Locals Facebook group, which is a really good Facebook group. If you live in East London and you want to um, glean any news from the hip happening Hackney Town, definitely recommend you check out uh, Hackney Wick Locals Facebook group on, uh, on Facebook. I remember it being mentioned but I didn't you know I didn't really keep uh tabs on it then they had a vote um late last night about you know if that kind of new legislation was going to come in force and unfortunately the bill was passed and it got me thinking a lot about the whole gentrification argument right because obviously when I was looking at the news on Twitter a lot of the kind of outrage a lot of the moaning came from people that were pro 
um, that were so sorry that were against the bill, right? So a lot of kind of hipsters, people involved in the nightlife scene, um, were kind of you know getting annoyed at the whole idea. And whenever you bring it up to people that with, with people who live in that community, there's always a lot of like you know. Um, there's always a lot of annoyance, right, about what's happened to Hackney in general, especially if you like, you know, if you're ever travelled on the Hack- on a, a London Overground from like Stratford to Hackney Wick, you know that that whole landscape, the whole area has changed a lot. You know, buildings come up, buildings go down, temporary pop up spaces go up, and then shiny new apartment buildings come along, and it just it kind of gets a bit nerfed out, right? And all the all the kind of um, excitement and energy and buzz that used to exist in that place is kind of dissipated right just because you know the olympics happened in stratford which kind of made stratford a kind of appealing place for people to come and live at then you know um building planners and estate agents decided to kind of build flats and apartments around the area to kind of attract people because london became a big center and then you got stratford london you got the london arena blah 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 you know how gentrification works, right? So um, eventually the people who originally moved to that area, who kind of made it what it is culturally, um, are now being priced out or just being booted out in general, right? Because, you know, you see that a lot happening with warehouse spaces in Hackney Wick. Most of them just get knocked down or the landlords get an offer. They just can't refuse and they kind of have to kick the tenants out. So it just got me thinking about the idea in general, but I thought I'd just, you know, expound it a little bit. But let's see, the post that kind of got me thinking was this post that I saw on, I think that, yeah, that bit, yeah, I, put, I clicked it on Twitter. Let me see, it should be on my Twitter page that I uploaded, but let me see. A bit narcissistic to post your own Twitter feed, but, you know, fuck it. So um, this is what the, the article from RA said, right? It says, uh, this is regarding the new night, nightlife laws, the new um, licensing laws for bars and nightclubs in Hackney. It says the following. The new licensing policy pro, uh, proposal calls for an 11pm uh, weekday curfew on all new pubs and clubs and a 12pm close time on the weekends, as well as requiring drinking and dining establishments to shut uh, outside areas by 10pm. Restaurants will be allowed to stay open an hour later. It will also call for an expansion of the Shoreditch special policy area, which requires proposed new venues to prove they will not add cumulative negative impact or other licensed establishments in the area, which is oh, insane. Imagine... now. Uh, and it's hard to kind of um, rationalize why they think this is a good idea, right? But imagine, imagine um, if you've ever been to Berlin or whatever, imagine Kreuzberg, right? Let's say because of the most base area. But Kreuzberg is kind of similar to Hackney in that respect, right? Or maybe Shoreditch in that it's still a bit hipster and DIY and a bit gritty, but it has got a, it's a little bit of a commercial leaning towards it, right? There's, you know there's uh frank and mankers and shit around you know it's like you know it's a little bit it's kind of a little bit nerfed out but not really but imagine that sort of area like kreuzberg have enforcing a curfew right that calls for new bars and clubs or most bars and clubs to shut by 11 p.m on a weekday and 12 on a weekend like you get an hour on a weekend an hour it's insane especially when you consider that that most of that area um there is a particular age range of people that live in the area. I would assume, just from the outside looking in, I would assume it's from the ages of like, let's say, majority. Let's just meet again. From, I'd say from the ages of like, let's say 24 to 45, right? Mo- mo- mostly. And, I've, and I'd guarantee you, people, everyone in that group of people, right, has been to a warehouse party once in their life, right? And is aware of what happens in that kind of area. They're not, it's not a shock to them, right? They're, they're not shocked when they roll out of their house and it's not pleasant don't get me wrong but they're not shocked that they roll out of their house and they happen to find a pile of vomit right on the sidewalk or just in front of their pavement right they're not that's not shock to them they're not they won't be shocked that they find baggies or needles on corners somewhere because people have been taking drugs late at night right they won't be shocked to see uh tins of cans on the floor because people were having street beers after a warehouse party somewhere this isn't a surprise to them so that kind of person isn't going to be kicking isn't gonna be kicking up a big fuss that bars and clubs need to close earlier because they're seeing all this mess around their house yes they'll be annoyed yes they might you know um get a bit pissed off they might shout through a window they might um, call the council but i don't think they'll go as far as um signing their name against a bill that's gonna close uh bars and nightclubs at 11 p.m on a weekday and 12 p.m on a weekend it's insane it's insane and the only thing that i have with it is like i try to always look at stuff from the other side right to look at it from both sides of the um of the argument and i guess i guess from let's 
let's take out Shoreditch. I think Shoreditch has an... If this happened in Shoreditch, I wouldn't be opposed to it, right? Because I think Shoreditch is... Even though it's like, you know, a very um, appealing place to go to uh, for nightlife sort of stuff, to go and hang out in bars and whatever, it is kind of... Lend, it's, it's kind of slowly but surely bending its way towards being more of a, a, a family. It's kind of turning into like a Stoke Newman 2.0. I think mainly because the, the inhabitants or the residents that used to live there before are all getting older, right? And they're um, over time, they're kind of starting families. So eventually the the age level is going to rise and it's going to become a more mature area and the kind of get fucked up Saturday night crew aren't going to be as welcome as they were in the beginning. And it's commercial enough of an area that it probably might need a bit of regulations. I don't know. I, it's just, I get it. I get it with Shoreditch. Shoreditch, I understand. But for Hackney... It makes no sense for the most part. It just makes no sense because most of these houses or these apartments or flats have been there just as long as the venues have been, right? And if you know anything about London nightlife or uh, hanging out in London, especially places like Hackney, right? For as many clubs that are opening, there is as many that are closing, right? It's not like they're opening at rapid rates. They open and they close. They open and they close continually over a long period of time. But the one thing that remains are the residents, right? So it's not as if like, every, it's not as if like the foot traffic is increasing and there's too many clubs and there's just way too many people there and it's just getting a bit crazy. It's kind of leveling itself out because eventually, you know, people get kicked out, people move, people go to South London, people go to North London. It kind of it it kind of spreads out. It doesn't stay. We don't have like we don't have like um place where people just stay forever. Like Dawson's, you know, still Dawson, but it wasn't the Dawson that I know of four years ago. It's kind of mellowed out a bit, but then they'll ha have have another cycle where it'll kind of pick up again, but it will then mellow out again. But that doesn't mean there's tons of new clubs opening in Dawson. There's still the same amount of clubs, if not less than where they were before. So it kind of bewilders me that they decided that Hackney needed this in general because. For the most part, the cleanup crew, the guys that clean up in the mornings after um, the weekend of debauchery and stuff are pretty good, right? I don't think there's ever been a time where I've r had a run early early Saturday morning and kind of stepped on a needle when I've run past Hackney. They do a good job of cleaning up after everyone's been out. Um, for the most part, people, the area itself, if you don't live there, you don't hang around for ages. You don't tend to go home afterwards. I don't really get it. I don't understand it at all. And, you know, there's an argument that to be said, I think they, they, they said it in the kind of paper that they um, released, that there was the, the counter argument was that, you know, London wants, um, City Khan wants London to be a 24 hour city, you know, with the introduction of the 24 hour tube, something that a lot of other m main metropolitan cities have kind of had for a long time, especially if over the weekends, we've only finally kind of woken up and got with the program but it's not even something it's not something that's expanded to all lines or something that's only on particular lines or particular days blah 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 but some the counter argument was that oh city car wants London to be a 24-hour city but we don't have the infrastructure or the venues that support that right so places don't open for 24 hours or even close to that right everything's closed in before 2 or before 3 a.m so you're not necessarily getting the benefit of even having a why have a 24-hour tube if no one's even staying out that late anyway because there's nothing nothing to go out to and I don't know, it just, it makes me wonder, I just think in general, like, it makes me wonder, like, how powerful the tenants of Hackney Council must be that they can push through a bill that no one is in favour of. Well, not no one, that most people aren't in favour of. It just, it makes me wonder, man, just how powerful the residents must be in general. Like, who are they? What kind of money had they have behind them? Because it's fucking insane. I think it's insane. It's literally insane. I don't get it at all. And what is the point of going out in Hackney if it's gonna, everything's going to close at 12? It's already bad enough as it is that some places are open until 2 or 1 a.m., right? It just makes no sense. And I don't I don't get it. I don't get it. I, don't, I think it might be a British thing in general because I think we have a very weird relationship with uh, drugs and alcohol and nightlife in London in general. I think there's a very, there's a bit of a taboo behind it. Not alcohol as much, but I don't know why because, you know, alcohol is probably as dangerous, maybe, maybe if not more dangerous than drugs in general, right? Um, in my opinion, again, but I think there's a, a real cultural clash or lack of understanding when it comes to nightlife. Like the people that don't like it want to make sure people that are enjoying it can't enjoy it, which I don't understand. That's the thing I've never got. So if you live in Hackney and you get annoyed that there's too many bars and clubs around your, where you live, the, the counter argument would be, why don't you just move somewhere else? Right. 
But then I guess if you want to live there, you're going to be like, no, I shouldn't have to move somewhere else just because you want to party. And if I live here, by default of me paying council tax, I have a right to say, fuck off, I don't want your bar and club, right? I get it. But there needs to be a middle ground. And I don't think the middle ground is 12 or 11 p.m. I don't think so. That's not That doesn't seem fair. That seems very much... Um, that seems very much in favor of residents as opposed to people that actually go out to these places or people that are actually investing the money in these bars and clubs, attracting people to these places in order to kind of make it somewhere people want to move to in the first place, which is the, which is the primary thing that's very much annoying about it. It's like someone, it's like someone coming to your house, right? And telling you how to redecorate it. It's like, huh? It just doesn't make any sense, man. It's just really bizarre. And it doesn't seem like there's any kind of uh, balance in the in these when they enforce these laws. It always seems as if they highly favor the residents, which gets me thinking that there must be some foul play going on in the background. Allegedly, I think so. This is my own hypothesis, right? There must be some kind of dodgy stuff going on in the background where the building regulators or people that build these new apartment blocks or convert old flats into new flats have some sort of weird agreement where if they're able to pass these laws that will maybe you know uh, carry favor when it comes to building regulations and getting new apartments and attracting new tenants and making the area more appealing and stuff i think that's part of it it must be it must be because it doesn't make any sense how residents of hackney who don't who haven't lived there as long or maybe you have lived as long as the venues have been there are suddenly now saying they don't want any of that stuff in their area and there's no balance there's like 11 12 people imagine having a, a nightclub that is that is that even a nightclub if you have if you're open until 12 only on a weekend that's not a nightclub like it's insane but then on the other side of it i think about it a little bit and i think can british people um handle actually living in a 24-hour city like could they really handle it and i'm not sure right because you look at stuff like love box you look at stuff like not hill carnival right you look at stuff like wireless festival glastonbury bestival and if you've ever been to these kind of places you'll know how fucking mental british and english people are when they go for festivals a lot of it has to do with the fact that we work like fucking dogs right most of us are working jobs that you know require you to work 36 hours plus a week so my fear is that working that hard in a job that you don't enjoy right but you're earning good amount of money because you know the the minimum wage in london is quite high comparatively to the standard of living um when you do have your free time to go out and get your freak on you go fucking hard right so there's there's not that tempering right we don't have that kind of like limit which is explains why people when um groups of british people go to places like mallorca or zanti and places they absolutely tear places to pieces and the residents get fucking the inhabitants that live there generally get annoyed with british people because you know we just can't we don't we're not used to that much sun that much free uh cheap drinks and great ambience we just go a bit crazy right because we have so much regulations it's sort of like the archetypal story of the kind of mormon girl the christian girl growing up um in a household where she's not allowed to play any uh, pop music or go out with her friends from nightclubs and she suddenly goes to college and becomes a, a massive slut right it's the idea that you've got so much restrictions on you that when you finally do get any a sniff of freedom you just go nuts so there's a part of me that thinks if we did get if we if we were allowed to have a 24-hour city could we handle it maybe not but i think there's a part that we, we need some kind of we need an education we need to be allowed to kind of like um make mistakes right we need to be allowed to kind of um er correct the er correct our ways in that respect but we can't correct our ways this way because it, it, what this reminds me of is the kind of laws they have in small cities like or northern cities in like manchester and liverpool and stuff where they have a thing where the culture there, especially if you read um, or if you see programs where ambulance services are going out to those places in Manchester and Leeds and they're picking up people that are falling over because they're getting fucked up over the weekend. The reason why that happens is because the bars and clubs in main um, strips in those kind of places uh, have run drink promotions usually from like the hours of like five to seven, right? Because they want to attract the after work crowd. So the after work crowd go there to get half price drinks, half price cocktails. Cool. 
then the bar then the, that pub or bar is only open until 11 anyway or 10 right so um people want to get their drinks in cheap at there because usually nightclub drinks are more expensive so they fucking neck their drinks get absolutely plastered in those places so that they can leave the bar or the pub or bar um on last orders at by 11 and then hop over to a nightclub that's only open until one so you have three hours in nightclub but then by the time you get there you're already trashed and it kind of encourages this idea that you're only drink you're drinking aggressively within a a, 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 a a really small window of time whether it's like four hours whether it's six hours seven hours not so well four to six hours right you're, you're drinking in a very very tight window and you're just kind of necking them back. And if you've ever seen like British people drinking on a night out, it's always really quick. And it's always big pints that are fucking warm. It's just ridiculous. It's just a ridiculous level of drinking that's not conducive to having a good time. So, with that being said, there is, it, it's probably counterintuitive to do this really in that respect, right? Because if anything, it just encourages people to drink more aggressively um, in a shorter period of time, as opposed to keeping bars and clubs open longer so that people don't get as fucked up because if you've ever been to berlin and i talk about berlin a lot on this podcast but if you've ever been to berlin you know that berlin is a place where most bars and clubs are open until 4 6 a.m sometimes uh 24 hours sometimes until 10 in the morning the next day so what happens is that because most bars and clubs sorry because most bars and quote-unquote pubs are already open quite late right people don't even people that go to nightclubs are the people that go to nightclubs not everyone goes to nightclubs some people will just spend their entire day like i went to go visit a friend of mine who works in an amazing bar i've got the name of it in um, berlin and she works in a bar club that's very popular and people just stay there and just get fucked up in there right they play really good music they have they might have a dj or they might have a really good uh, music set up in there and people just sit in there and just chill and have some drinks and relax so that you are drinking from 7 until 4 a.m in an act in the national pub which might mean you might not have as many pints as you would do if the bar was closing at 11 p.m but then it also might mean that you might just go home afterwards you might leave the bar f- feel a bit tipsy and think you know what i'm just gonna go home but the nightlife scene in london is so much is so um tightly controlled and that it requires people to kind of save up all their pent up energy for the weekend or for the end of the month when they get paid they overload on drugs, they overload on alcohol, and then they fucking explode in the venue that they're in because they know it's the, it's the kind of like, it's like um, project, it's like a Project X fucking scene, right? It's the last time they're going to be able to party hard in this venue. This tonight is the night. And it's just super lame for this city to have this, like especially a bar of Hackney. Like Hackney is so cool. There's so many cool places to go to. It's, it's a place where... It's got great transport links. It's not the best, of, of obviously, because it's not 24-hour tube, but it's pretty easy to get to most places from Hackney and stuff. And it's like, why do this? I don't get it. And again, I just don't like the lack of balance. That's the only thing I don't like. I just don't like the lack of balance. It seems as if it's it's very weighted. for It's heavily weighted in, in, a, in the favor of the residents with no consideration of the people that actually go out and enjoy getting fucked up on a weekend. But I think, again, like I said, culturally, I just don't think we're ready for it. I just think, I remember having an argument with somebody about this at work. I think I think England will be the last place on earth that where they'll legalise marijuana. We just don't have a good relationship with drugs in general or that kind of uh, seedy nightlife culture. It's not something we, I don't, again, I don't know what it is. I would love to read some books about it if everyone has had any recommendations uh, around it to kind of understand what this what this tension is about but i think there is something there undercurrent of behind it about why why do bars and clubs wind up people so much to this extent where they want to enforce these laws and these bills and these legislations and these restrictions i don't get it it's really 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 weird but um yeah that's what's happening in hackney um r.i.p hackney i guess not in that extent, especially if you're opening a new bar or club i feel sorry for you um or god god bless you and stuff but pff, allow it Anyway, what's this on docket? Um, oh, I want to talk about Ronaldo CR7 going to Juventus. I'm sure a lot of you are aware of this, or if you're not aware of this, Cristiano Ronaldo, one of the best players in the world, right, has decided to um, seek pastures new and head over to Juventus from Real Madrid. It's weird because what is he now? 33, 34 Ronaldo, right? He's, he's supposedly got towards heading towards the end of his career, but he's probably never been better, right? He's, um, he's obviously keeps himself in amazing shape. Um, 
his limited amount of injuries that he has. And even when he does have injuries, he comes back at frightening levels of speed. So I'm assuming, you know, there might be some PDs involved there, but we don't care because he's an amazing player. And usually someone of his age um, decides to kind of like um, wallow away their latter years of their career in Japan or in China or in America, right? And earn the fucking big bucks. But Ronaldo, being the consummate professional and being the winner that he is, has decided to go to Serie A, which is, again, it's not, it's not a Mickey, it's not, it's not the hardest league in the world, but it's not a Mickey Mouse league, right? It's still a league that's very competitive. And Testi's kind of, you know, his metal um, playing for Juventus, which is going to be amazing to see. But I love the reaction behind it. Number one, his jersey sold out, right? I think it's on pre-order now. You have to wait ages to get it. And I saw this clip or this kind of tweet as well that made me kind of laugh as well. So supposedly, um, the news is that Cristiano, as you can see on the screen here, I'm going to read it out. Cristiano's Forza Juve post is the seventh most, seventh most liked post in, of Instagram with 11.1 uh, 11 .1 likes and it's only been posted for two days, right? So let me see what, he's, uh, what it is saying now at the moment. Cristiano Ronaldo Instagram. That's an insane, right? 11.1 11 .1 likes is fucking nuts. I love how his name on Instagram is just Cristiano. That's nice as well. Um, let's see. He's got 136 million followers. It's like, Jesus Christ. Um, where is it? Forza. Okay, here we go. Forza. Oh, it's 11.3. So, imagine. So, And then I looked at a list of, of, of tweets of Instagram posts that are up there, which is quite sick to see. He's in good company. So, number one, the most liked post on Instagram is, is both is owned by the same person, Kylie Jenner. Number one post is a photo of her daughter. Number two is the second one of her daughter. So, 17 and 13, uh, respectively. Then, the third most liked post, which I didn't, which is another surprising one, is Justin Bieber's uh, engagement to Hayley Baldwin, which has got 12.6 fouls, 12.6 mil. And then, Cristiano's announcement of his uh, baby being born is 11.4. Beyonce, Cristiano. Amazing, isn't it? Yeah. Just amazing. Um, oh, and XX Tentacion as well is on that list too. He's 12. XX Tentacion's final image before his death has got 10.1 million likes on Instagram, which is fucking insane. So it seems that the, the, the 10 most popular people on social media are Kylie Jenner, Justin Bieber, Cristiano Ronaldo, Beyonce, Cristiano Ronaldo. No, sorry. Yeah, so Kylie Jenner, Justin Bieber, Cristiano Ronaldo, Beyonce, and Selena Gomez, and The Rock. Which is interesting, isn't it, right? The most um, well-known people in the world are those people. But yeah, um, it should be interesting to see what he does at Juventus. Um, again, uh, I don't think it's going to be as easy as he's expecting it to be. But I also think people are going to be surprised by how much he's going to dominate. I think it might be interesting to kind of find out who the top scorers in Serie A were, actually. Because that will kind of give an indication of just how well he might do. Um, scoring wise so I think that's that's the metric that he's measuring himself at predominantly I'd imagine um, coming to the age that he's at, at the moment uh, top scorer in Serie A right hopefully they, they have it here like a list of all the top scorers right and then uh, season by season I want right da, da, da. let's see here Serie statistics let's see if I can get it up on there for each I want to see for each season this will kind of give an indication of how well he's going to do um so this is this 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 yeah this last okay so in this season so in um the season just gone uh immobile was 29 right so top scorers in the serie are immobile with 29 uh mauro Icardi with 29 paolo de Bala with 22 uh quagarello with 19 and mertens with 18 right and he went in 16 now i think if you're ronaldo right and you're playing for a juventus side that's probably going to be built around you um, you're going to have people like Paolo uh, Diabala playing alongside you. Um, you're going to have a midfield that's going to be absolutely stacked. Emery Khan just moved there, right? An absolute engine in, in the midfield as well. I think he'd be, I think he'd, he'd, he'd be, he wouldn't be crazy to say he could easily get 20 goals a season playing for Juventus right now in that league. If, Gon if Gonzalo Higuain can score 16 and he misses quite a lot of chances too, and he's not the most mobile of strikers in the world, if he can get 16, I think Ronaldo could get 20 easy. So I think it's going to be it's going to be frightening how easy it's going to be for him to get to high numbers. But I think it's also going to be a lot more difficult than he expects. Um, it'll be interesting to see how long he lasts um, at Juventus, whether it's a thing where I'm not sure if his contract is two years or three years. But it'll be interesting to see if he's, if he's able to perform 
at that level for that long of a period or if it's going to be something where he kind of takes a really big nosedive towards the end of it. Um, but it's interesting to see in general. I think it's great for the league or great for professional football for us to see someone of Cristiano's undying ability still performing at that level right now. It's fucking insane. And yeah, I just, I, I can't wait, man. I cannot wait to see what he does next. Really cannot wait. I think it's a great for Serie A in general. It's going to, you know, I'm, I'm sure people, people that don't even know Juventus existed are going to be watching these games as well. So, yeah. More power to the guy. Um, what else? Uh, oh, talking about FOMO. Um, well, I mentioned earlier before about, you know, AI and shit. This amazing video I told you over there actually of Gary V. Gary V is one of my heroes. I love him. I love Gary V. Um, probably one of the only people on social media or the internet space in, to, in that kind of motivational space um sphere who i listen to consistently and never get bored uh someone who has loads of actionable instructions for you to uh take on board that are really going to enhance your life and someone who kind of is very adept at cutting through the bullshit right he's very good at zeroing in at what the issue is and offering actual practical tips and it actually and it helps too that he's an actual entrepreneur like a real one he's not one of these guys who's selling ebooks or courses online he actually runs a business right and you can see it from the way he kind of carries himself and the kind of things that he speaks about. And I love the message that he puts out of being self-aware, you know, of um, eating shit and working really hard at your craft um, for a long period of time before you break through, you know, kind of dispelling these myths that you need to be looking at what someone else is doing so you can judge what how if what you're doing is right or wrong um really doing away with the idea of hacking stuff and really kind of like working really hard at what you do in order to get better at it like loads of really uh salient points and this video that you uploaded recently uh is one that really struck home with me and kind of very much so um lends itself to the stuff that i've kind of been speaking about i've kind of been thinking about a lot lately you know the idea that you know social media has kind of increased people's anxiety and made them worry about things they shouldn't be worrying about and has also made them be very envious without you know envious of people that they shouldn't really be envious of like you know it doesn't make any sense like you're not in the same you're not in the same league let alone the same planet like it doesn't make any sense that we should be envious of somebody who has who's far ahead of what you're doing just work slowly and show that your craft and you'll get there too but this video really explains it and i'm going to play it now he, he kind of explains a lot better than i am rambling my way through it but this video really touched uh, a soft spot in my heart. If you are not happy with Let me fast forward it to, where is it? About 70 to go. To look at life from a different perspective. He's talking to some, he's talking to like a really big um, go up and down. kind of personality in, in the Philippines, I'm assuming, who's called uh, Zian Lim, right? Um, in the car, which is amazing. I, and I love what this is always, like he's always doing stuff on the move. You see him kind of, walking around and taking meetings on the fly and running a business and he's got a full-time kind of vlogging team that follow him around and shit i love it i think it's fucking amazing um and he's kind of how he's kind of hacked and plugged himself into hip-hop culture he's just an amazingly astute person who i think if you're really conscious of, if you're really curious about how to kind of make it within that social media platform or just in terms in terms of a small business in terms of entrepreneurship and you want to listen to somebody who isn't full of shit Gary Vee's your guy. But this is the bit that I kind of wanted to um, highlight. From there, 17. Hopefully it's just... Damn, should I be doing this? Yep. I'm, I'm like that. I'm like, damn, should I be? What you're realizing in culture and, you know, is that the attention is going away from the movie theater and the television and going into the phone and these platforms. <laughs> That's true. So That's you, true. you can feel that you won something and now it's going away. Yes, exactly, exactly. I'm there aware. You go. There I, you go. Brother, I know what the score is. <laughs> I know what the score is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But but I think you need to not look at that as a negative. Yeah. You need to look at that as a positive. Because if you were an actor from 25 years ago, you would have just become complacent. You're lucky that the game's forcing you to have to be sharp again. And I just, I just love it. I love it. I think the whole conversation is really good. Um, the kid that he speaks to... These conversations are always better when the person that he's speaking to or anyone in general, I guess it goes for most interviews, <coughs> where they let their guard down. Uh, the kid's being very vulnerable, or the kid or the guy's being very vulnerable and kind of really kind of um, 
being honest at where his pain points are, the place that he feels inadequate with, and then he's allowing Gary to kind of dissect him and kind of really psychoanalyze, really psychoanalyze him in a really honest way and something that really cuts through and gets to the main chunk of it, right? And, um, and there's a bit actually towards the end that is really interesting too, where he kind of says, where Gary kind of says to the kid, um, he kind of gives him a reassurance that you're going you're gonna to be fine, don't worry, right? And it's because of the way he answered the question, because there's a, there's a part in it where kind of Gary's kind of really kind of going for him, right? Saying to him, like, look, you, you know what I mean? You're, you're looking at it all wrong. And the kids just keep, he's, he's going, yeah, 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 true, true. You know, that kind of like, he's underst he understands that he's in the wrong. He understands that he's maybe looking at it the wrong way and he needs to kind of uh, change his perspective. And, Ga and Gary kind of seizes on that opportunity to let him know that, look, you're going to be okay. And I think this message at the end is really poignant too, actually. I'll, I'll play this too, because I think this was quite a really good point as well to kind of um, think about whenever you're complaining and stuff. Terry, like, like you're, you're going to win, dude. Like, I poked and you didn't run away or you, you said, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, like, listen to me, listen to me. I mean this very, very, very seriously. Own your truths. Expose your secrets. You'll, be, you'll, you'll, beco you'll become 100% unstoppable. Thanks, man. Million dollar advice right there. Man, that's that's why I love Gary Vee, man. On the fly, right? Changing people's lives. He's the fucking best at it. I recommend you check out all his stuff on social. It's the best stuff that I listen to a lot of the times. He does this thing where he'll kind of rant and rave and say, you shouldn't be watching my shit, you should be doing. And it'll kind of get you really start. He's, he's really good at doing, mo he's really good at motivation that leads to action. Because a lot of people that are big on the whole motivational uh, woo ha rah, rah, rah shit, right? That just kind of gets you fired up for nothing, right? But he's really big on motivation that's going to lead to action. You're going to actually do things. Um, I love the idea that he kind of did recently where um, you go to like a dollar store or like a, a, a market, you buy something cheap and you flip it on eBay or Amazon. He basically says there's money to be made there, right? Because... I think he's he's been really honest and good at um, understanding that a lot of people on social, a lot of people online who kind of want to be influencers and stuff, don't necessarily want to be millionaires, even though they say they do. What they want is that lifestyle. It kind of goes back to the Tim Ferriss uh, four hour work week um, idea, right? It's not about being rich. It's about being, it's not about being catch rich. It's about being time rich, right? It's about being able to do what you like with the time that you have, right? And it's about being able to earn as much as you can uh, to sustain your lifestyle, but that's it. Not like, you know, hoarding mass and ma masses of cash or living in a gold house or driving a gold Lamborghini. What you actually want is to be able to live the life that you want by your, you know, on your own, on your own time, right? Do the stuff that you will want and the stuff that you enjoy. And that doesn't necessarily require you to have like, you know, a high paying job. You could easily go to, you know, a, a fleet market or a boot sale or over the weekend buy some shit and then flip it online and easily make a thousand pounds over the weekend or 500 quid or 200 quid which will go a long way in terms of your overall happiness right and i think most people is going back to the whole ai conversation i had before in the beginning if like our jobs get automated and we get given universal basic income but imagine for the short for the time being you're able to work a job that you are not enjoying that much but you're also earning 200 to 500 quid a extra by doing a, a couple of hours work over the, every weekend i mean every evening when you come back home i think a lot of people will be happy with that right that extra 500 quid will go a long way that that's the extra 500 quid or 200 quid is maybe an extra holiday it's maybe an extra weekend away it's maybe uh, a couple more dinners out with your uh, with your significant other it might be a couple more presents for your kids and shit it's, it could go a long way so i think gary's very um important he's very um necessary in a culture especially nowadays when we're getting so many mixed signals and people are um paying attention to the app the wrong things completely i think gary v is one of the people that you should be definitely listening to and i recommend you check out everything that he's got on social uh check him out um it's pretty easy to find uh gary spelled like gary and v uh v double e on most social media platforms he's got a, a he's got a, a very good youtube page that i follow Gary V and also Ask Gary V show where he does a kind of a Q&A show but everything that he does I, I always listen to so I definitely recommend you check that out um, what else I wanted to speak about that's on the list um, for a moment. there's some stuff I want to go maybe later. oh did you, did you see a story about Drake giving that shiggy kid uh, 250,000 now the internet says this I'm not sure if it's true right it might not be true but the story goes that Drake supposedly um gave the kid that uh, did the in my feeling dance like that kiki if you love me i ran it all that shit yeah he could probably he gave him 
which is amazing, right? It's not sure if it's true, but if it is true, it just goes to show why people love Drake, right? He's very um. He's just maybe that self aware is a good idea. He's a great guy. He's a good dude, isn't it? Like he didn't have to do this. And if you believe the rumors, especially if you listen to what um uh Joe, Joe Budden said in his podcast, the the word on the street is that supposedly um the OVO team were kind of like angling to have the Michael Jackson song be this breakout single from um uh what's it, from Scorpion. That was gonna be the lead single. But then the Shiggy kid is the one that did the dance, right? For um, in your feet, in my feelings, that led to in my feelings then being the actual single that was gonna be, you know, uh, made a video of and it went fucking viral and people are requesting it everywhere, which is funny, isn't it? Like I didn't, I didn't know that was the, I didn't know that was the case at all. Um, but it's great to see uh, Drake give the kid some money, and I got this article now actually on Billboard. I'll quickly read out. Um, it says. Since the release of Scorpion last month, all 24, 25 tracks on Drake's the fifth, fifth album have clawed their way into Billboard 100. This week, In My Feelings, unseated Nice For What as number one sh um, slot on the Hot 100, allowing Drake's supremacy to continue. One reason In My Feelings has steamrolled past the competition because the latest dance challenge birthed by Instagram comedian Shiggy. And on Monday, July 16, Drake praised Shiggy for his recent efforts. Oh my goodness, man got me number one record today. Oh my God, said an elated Drake when filming Shiggy at a party in Los Angeles. The Drake star caused a frenzy two weeks ago when he unleashed a dance on his millions of followers. So it's fucking amazing, right? It's fucking amazing. And I think there's a video now, right, of this, of this, of Drake saying this, right? Of Shiggy. Let's play this now. Man, big up, man. Big up, Drake, man. That's fucking sick, right? That's that's awesome. I think that's awesome. It goes to show him how to be a great guy. He didn't need to do that. Uh, big up, Shiggy, as well. But it maybe does go to show where the kind of music industry is leaning towards, right? Imagine this kind of being a thing um, where labels will start paying these kind of uh, dancery guys and girls on social media or on Instagram to start doing challenges and dances and stuff in order to kind of get their songs up. Or kind of boost it, right? Because I remember there was a kind of thing. This kind of thing happened to the latter stages of Vine. When Vine was kind of heading towards this end. Some labels were reaching out to some Vine people. And getting them to play music on their clips and shit. I remember even Gary V mentioning it to some people. That um, some hip-hop guys should reach out to vloggers and YouTubers. And get them to kind of like play their music on their vloggers on their vlogs and shit. It would be a good way to kind of get their stuff to go viral. Or to kind of creep up the charts. Or to kind of gain new fans. But it's an interesting way to kind of... Um, it's an interesting way of get of getting a, a new fan base or to kind of get your tune to go number one. And um, I think the number one thing is only going to be reserved for the, you know, the, the one percent of top stars up there because they're already, you know, very well known anyway. I don't think if this song was made by anybody else, it'd be as big. Right. It's the fact that it's a Drake song and the fact that it's a sick song anyway in general has kind of led to its success. But I think if you're, you know, a, a reasonable level, a reasonable, a reasonably well known artist, it wouldn't, you know, it would be a good idea to also do this too because you just might get some new fans as well, right? You might end up um, creating a viral moment that might allow you to tour a couple more states or a couple more countries. I think that's all good. So it's an interesting way of how the music industry is kind of evolving. I'm interested to see where it's going to kind of go in the future nowadays. But it's amazing. Great to see um, Drake acknowledge it, um, not be a dickhead about it. And just, you know, if, even if it's not true, even if he just got, took the guy out for a drink and told him to hang out with a crew, it's fucking sick, man. Do you know what I mean? You don't meet, you don't know who this guy is, but he idolizes music and suddenly he, he, he slips into your DMs and tells you to kind of come out and hang out with them when they go to LA and shit. I think that's all cool. I think it's amazing. Even if you didn't give me money, I think that's fucking amazing too. So big up Drake and big up Shiggy. Happy for all these guys. Anyway, that's an hour, uh, I think, so far. Um, this has been the Agnes News English Show, numbers, episode number 84, as always. I told you I'd do it. I told you I'd fucking do it! Um, this has been fun. It's been amazing. I hope it's been as fun for you guys as it's been for me. I have had a blast. I'm going to do one more tomorrow to kind of close out this week and kind of keep it going. Um, as ever, um, if you need any information regarding what I'm doing um, in terms of DJing, in terms of the blogs I write, in terms of pictures I take, in terms of other shit that I do, click the link below the video description or in the podcast um, description thing in your whatever app you're using. And you'll see a link there to my website, which is axnozinga.com. That contains all my DJ listings, my blog, my photography page, uh, the store that will open up very soon where I'll be uh, flogging all my zines. 
that I made and some random t-shirts that I've done and all that other bits and bobs because you know you gotta keep you gotta keep going you gotta keep making shit and hope one thing pops off and then you can just whoo you're off the races um and also I th- I'm thinking as well I don't know if I need I don't know if I should because I'm I'm scared I'm being a pussy about it but I really want to st- I really want to start doing stand up um I I've, I've been thinking about jokes in my head that I want to write which I haven't written which is another wrong like, bad thing not to do but I really want to try my hand at stand up I guess listening to so much Joe Rogan and The Fighter and the Kid and Legion of Skanks and all that, Come Town, all that sort of shit. I just, I don't know, I get re- I get in a really jokey m- mood and I think maybe I could do it too, right? M- maybe it's a bad thing to think that way, right? Maybe because it seems so easy. I think, not easy, but it seems that like I could do it too. The, the barrier of entry is just me having to sit down. The barrier of entry is low because it just requires me having to sit down and write jokes, right? Um, which I think I should be able to do. Um, I might go into it blind. I haven't, I haven't, I haven't watched even a YouTube video about how to write a joke, right? I might go into it blind, just write them, and see how those go. And then if I go up first time at an open mic and it flops, I might then go back to a video and kind of. I don't know if I should go into it naive. You know, sometimes when you do stuff naively, it's probably usually the best thing to do because you go into it just like a dickhead and you do stuff like wrong or you do stuff the right way. Like it's sometimes. You know what I mean, it can be two faults. I'm not sure if I should or not, but what do you guys think? I don't know. I'm thinking to maybe do a stand-up as well to add another strength to my bow. But it's something I've always been interested in doing anyway. Um, but it's just the fear of getting up, you know? The fear of kind of like fucking up and flopping. Because already with the DJing stuff, it's already fucking bad enough as it is, right? When I have a bad DJ set, or I think I did poorly, the fucking shame that um, uh, f- that falls all over you, that's kind of hovering over you like a fucking dark cloud as I'm walking home or I'm in an Uber on the way back. It's just... I can't describe it. That idea that you've probably subjected people to like four hours of shitty music. It's just, it just feels so bad. And the moment you're giving the money at the end of the gig or you're giving cash and you're like, you feel a bit dirty that you're taking money for something that you feel like you didn't do a good job at. So imagine doing that, but you don't even, I don't even have a, at least with the DJing stuff, I have like CDJs and the fucking booth to hide behind, right? There's a barrier. I can kind of, you know, just keep my head down, right? I can kind of just like look down and not look at anyone and kind of like not be embarrassed. But with a microphone telling jokes and shit and then fucking up and having to look at people's faces as they like, I don't know, shake their head or they kind of just stare at you blankly. It's like, ugh. It's sort of like, you know when you say hi to somebody that you know, but they don't say hi back or they don't see you or they ignore you and you have that feeling of like, you got your hand up and you're like, oh shit. That kind of shame. I've, I'd imagine bombing on stage is like that, but times how many other people are in the fucking audience. You know what I mean? It's like a, you're just frozen like, oh, fuck. And then I just imagine what happens after. Because I imagine when you go to open mic or you get to a point where you're getting, maybe not say, let's say, quote, quote, paid with drink tokens to perform at a stage, right? And then you do a fucking shitty show and that feeling afterwards, when you're at the bar having a drink and you have did a bad job, it's like, ah. And, and the bartenders are having to kind of like, you know, you know, you know, tough crowd, you know, just trying to have them to console you. But you know, it's not a tough crowd because the, the guy I get after you is getting absolute bluffs for minutes. So I don't know. Maybe the fact that I'm talking about it so much means I should give it a go. I think I probably am. I need to do it. Uh, I need to kind of get on it. I guess, again, it's second half of the year. I'm really pumped up. I don't know what it is about July that kind of got me crunked. Um, there's only six months of left year, six months of the year left. I don't want to look, I don't want to get to December or January of next year and then start writing fucking a whole new pla- a whole new fucking list of goals. I want to at least achieve something by the end of this year and then something I can kind of carry over to the new year. But I don't know, I'm pumped. Maybe I should do it because I'm talking about it so much. But yeah, let's see. Maybe, maybe that'll be some, maybe I'll be another section I'll add to my website. Stand up tour. That might, that'll be fucking nuts, isn't it? But I've got to start writing fucking stuff. I've got to start writing jokes and going to open mics to see if I can do that for the first part. But yeah, anyway, this has been the Action Zinger Show episode number 84. Thanks again for tuning in. If you listen to this via uh, the podcast, audio, app, whatever, you'll hear some music to kind of close this out. If you're watching this on YouTube, this is going to end very, very, very abruptly. But thanks for checking me out. This has been the Action Zinger Show episode number 84. I'll see you back again tomorrow. Peace!